how do you say uh, hello and welcome in Italian? Uh, ciao a tutti e benvenuti. I think I'll just stick with ciao. Ciao. <laughs> ciao. Ciao. <laughs> ciao, Italian readers. It's wonderful to yeah. see you. The Italian readers are uh, ready for uh, reading again Limpfle Welling and the first three books of the Night Runner series in Italy. And I'm really humbled to be able to interview you and uh, bring your perspective to the Italian public about uh, your first uh, trilogy, even though it's not really a trilogy, but uh, <laughs> we are going to <laughs> go over it with the questions. So I will start with the first questions and I'm probably gonna butcher the pronunciation because we Italian love to create our own pronunciation for words. <laughs> so like uh, Alec and uh, I think uh, the right pronunciation is like Sarah Gill. Sarah Gill. Yeah, but in Italian we say Sarah Gill. Yeah. So, <laughs> Okay, so let's start with the first question. And the Night Runner saga has almost an episodic plot, like the first book has a plot, second book, different topic. And in each book, the heroes must fight uh, the new threat. Instead, the Tamir Striad, your other saga, has more of a linear plot. The sensation with the, run, with the Night Runner is to observe a few adventures in the lives of two characters which has and will have many adventures. Uh, why have you adopted this episodic nature and uh, what was the final result you wanted to convey to the readers? Well, there are two kinds of writers. There are gardeners who grow things slowly and organically and there are architects who plan everything out. I am a gardener. And so I wrote the first two books, and then I had another idea, and I wrote another book and another book. <clears throat> but the reason they're episodic is actually on purpose. One of my great influences is Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes sagas. And they were individual adventures with two characters that you like very much. And so that was my intention with the Night Runner books, is to have these two characters who are the center of the story, and then to give them new things to conquer. And by by having them go through these different adventures, they develop as people. You know, they're not the same in book four as they are in book one. They grow, and you know, some some books the heroes never change they're always the same they never have scars they don't have bad dreams and i wanted alec and saragal to be very real to be very human even though saragal is not technically human yes i think actually you succeeded in that uh, one of my favorite example of this is when uh, sarah gill in book one take a strange uh, chain strange uh, jewel and uh, he does what he does. And then in book seven, he finds a strange jewel, but instead of doing what he did in the first book, he just said, hmm, this is a strange jewel. Better not wear it. Not yeah. wear it. <laughs> <laughs> Made so, that mistake, right? I'm not going to do it again. <laughs> so, yeah, actually, the second question is about the character, which I think is the soul of the saga. The plot are nice, uh, are perfect to convey, but they are a stage for the character, for your perfect character, because your characters are charismatic and well fleshed out. And uh, even if at the beginning they remind of very classical archetypes, uh, the mentor, the young lad that is learning the world, mm -hmm they are never static in their roles. What is important for you to characterize complex and real personalities? For me, the, my enjoyment of writing and my enjoyment of reading other people's work is character. If I don't like the characters, then it doesn't matter what else happens. As you know, going back to Sherlock Holmes, you know, I've read those dozens and dozens and dozens of times. I know what's going to happen. It's being with Holmes and Watson again that is the fun part. And I like to think that maybe my readers find that is to go, but when you reread them, it's not a mystery anymore, but you get to see new things about these characters. And so 
yeah, character, and it's my favorite thing to write. To me, there is nothing more interesting than people. Uh, in my day job, I'm a psychotherapist now, and I work with people and their issues, and I have to, it's very much like the writing. You sit there and you explore the character and how, how I can help them. In the books, I don't help them. I put them into more trouble. And that's where the story comes from. Yeah, but by fleshing them out, you know, every book, they get older, they have more experiences together, they have experiences separately as they do in Shadows Return, and they grow. It's so important that they grow as people. So by the time you get to the end of book seven, again, they're not the same people that you met in chapter one of book one. And I think they are very different. Thinking about Alec or Thero in book one and in book yeah. seven, they are completely different persons. Yeah, Thero was a lot of fun. I didn't really expect very much of him in the beginning, but he really took on his character and his mistakes and his ability to, to come back from them. And for Nysander to be able to not just push him away, but to say, okay, you know, you did this bad thing. Whoops, I don't want to say too much. But um, <laughs> but um, that he could still grow. Everybody grows. And that's, you know, I, when I say that I write like a gardener, it's I'm, I'm growing. I plant the seeds and I watch them grow and I tend them and just see what happens. I mean, when I sit down at the computer to write, I have an idea of what I want to do that day. But sometimes three hours later, something totally different has come out and it's much better than what I'd planned. <laughs> so I trust my, my unconscious mind to guide me to what needs to happen. You know, when I write, it's like I'm watching a movie and, and reporting on it. I really see things as I write. <laughs> okay, so I say that we move on to the third questions. Okay. The third question is about uh, the relationship with between Alec and Sarah Gill, which is, of course, one of the main elements, even one of the main selling points of mm -hmm. the book. Alec and Sarah Gill relationship uh, is actually my favorite relationship in literature. <laughs> Honestly, oh, <no>. the <laughs> their relationship is just real because uh, I know that the new readers will love them as much as I love them because it's impossible not to love them. In particular, uh, they will love how you characterize what they mean for each other and uh, how what they mean for each other changes between uh, all the books. Mm, the relationship is real and uh, ever changing and uh, spoiler, but not really. Even after they become lovers, uh, it evolves. It's not static. Yes. The lover is not uh, the point of arrival. No. They grow. No. They grow in the relationship as they grow as individuals. So, what do you feel is the role of Alec and Sergil relationship through the books? And especially how it relates to the plots, which have uh, quite high stakes. Okay. Well, as I said earlier, you know, character is my favorite thing, creating characters and growing the characters. And so Alec and Saragol were the story for me. And then I had to find things for them to do. And that's where the books came from. <laughs> so if that makes sense. So yeah, there I knew where I wanted that relationship to go, but I didn't want it to be what the books were about if that makes sense. You know, I, I wasn't aware of the male-male erotica that was developing. And so people kept asking me, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? That's what happens in these books. And I said, well, I don't know about those books. I'm doing my own thing. And so like in some conventions, once they become lovers, that's the end of the story, you know, and then it's happily ever after, after that. And that you know, for me, it was just the beginning of a new phase. And as lovers, as people who have each other's hearts, but who also have to go into danger and put that aside so that they can accomplish the mission was very challenging and a lot of fun. 
you know, they they have, you know, they are night runners, they are spies for the queen. And so when they have a mission to do, they have to accomplish that mission because the stakes are very high. And but in the meantime, they also have a life. And so they have, you know, places they live, they have things they enjoy doing when they're not out, you know, killing things or people. And you know, it's important that they be three-dimensional. Many of my readers were very young and they thought, well, once they get together, that's the ending. But I was older and I have been married for a long time. And so I know what it is to be lovers, but also to continue to grow, to have a life together, to have that impact on each other, but also be free to do other things. And so I, it was sort of important to me as, as a person in a long time relationship to say, no, it doesn't get boring after that. I guess that was what people would say. Oh, once you're together, it's boring. Well, no, it's not. <laughs> it just changes. Uh, it's uh, actually really, really impressive because uh, I think that um, even because of this characteristic, of, of course, uh, it's not uh, the entirety of the book. Uh, absolutely not. The book uh, are about characters, are about their role, their growth. Uh, and uh, the lives of characters, the lives of people, sometimes involves romance. And so it was really interesting seeing a book which has um, this uh, strong and well-crafted romance, but uh, the plot is about uh, everything else. Mm -hmm. The reason for the books is everything else. The romance is always there because it gives like uh, the um, like a feeling of being at home. Mm -hmm. Like Alec and Sergei are the uncle, are the uncles of the readers <laughs> too, as uh, the uh, Mikon's daughter. I call them uncles. Sometimes I say I miss the uncles. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I like that. So, and it was also important to, to surround them with important people. You know, the, you know, in writing, you might call them secondary characters, but you know, they have to have lives like Mike McCavish and his family, I think, are not really secondary characters. They're just, you don't see them all the time, but they're so important to Saragal and then to Alec as well. And then the royalty, which is contrasted with the kind of lower life that they get into running through the sewers. And so, you know, they just have a very great variety of characters that they come into contact with, like Nysander and Thero, and you know the the Cabishes and all these other people that are integral to the story. The the side characters, the secondary characters, uh, too are great. He, uh, Thero, Clea, Kilia, Clea. Clea. How it's pronounced? Clea. Clea. Perfect. Neither of the pronunciation. <laughs> I, I need to do like an auditory. Di dictionary or something <laughs> for real, just pronounce everything. <laughs> yes, for the Italian readers, absolutely. Then, uh, if we have time, I have a question okay. related to the Italians. <laughs> okay. Yes, it's strange uh, for me because um, I really promote your books like a little too much. It's <laughs> kind of my friends would say it's an obsession for me, and <laughs> it is. And uh, sometimes uh, the people come to me and say, but it, it is, is, is it a romance? And I'm like, no, it's not a romance. It's really fantasy. The focus is on the fantasy, on the plot, on the characters. But uh, yeah, the romance is there, it's perfect. I really, really um, see uh, when you say that is about the love doesn't get boring, uh, it's not mm -hmm. uh, you arrive, right, you get together, it's done. It's about growing, it's about finding a new way to express your love. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that is what makes uh, the relationship between Alec and Sergio so relevant in the mm -hmm. books. And uh, also the role of the saga in the fantasy landscape. Uh, without being at the center of everything. I yeah. think you may, you wrote a better romance than romance books. Yeah, I, I don't know how to write a romance novel. I just know how to write 
people loving each other. So in the second part of the interview, I would like to talk to you about your perspective, about uh, what it meant to publish uh, the books in the 90s. Uh, because uh, I'm actually younger than Luck in the Shadows, I mentioned it before, <laughs> and a lot of your new <laughs> readers are younger than Luck in the yes. Shadows than the <laughs> trilogy. And so maybe uh, I think it could be interesting for them to understand the DA landscape in which uh, the book has been published. So I'll make a little introduction because during the 80s and 90s, authors started introducing queer characters in fantasy setting. And uh, at least for me, but not only, Lucky in the Shadows uh, represent a positive climax of this trend. And so how did you perceive the fantasy landscape in uh, those years? And what brought you to write uh, the first trilogy? And what are the stories that influenced you the most? Of course, I personally can see a strong influence of Ellen Kushner uh, sword point. <laughs> I'd never read it. I really? No. Sword point, no. Uh, no, I, I had not read Swords Point. I didn't know about Mercedes Lackey. Uh, I hadn't read any of those. Uh, I just in the 80s, when I started writing it, er, fantasy was very, a lot of the fantasy I was reading was very male dominated. And the women were either fainting damsels, or if they had any power, they were bitches. And you know, you just couldn't have a powerful woman who wasn't unpleasant. And so I didn't like that very much. Uh, then I thought about queer characters. And I mean, you get little glimpses, you get little teases in some of the books, but they're usually either a sidekick, a victim, or a villain. And I wanted to break that mold very much. You know, when I was growing up in my teens and 20s, it was the era of the women's rights movement here in, the, in this country, and also the gay rights movement. And somehow those two movements happening at the same time sort of felt like, well, if we're all against the same person, then we must be friends. <laughs> so, and so I've always been very pro-gay, pro-queer. And so I thought, what if I really broke the mold and made my main character gay? And would it sell? And I mean, I had no idea if I would ever sell a book. I just knew what I wanted to write. And that is my my advice to new writers is don't look too tightly at the market. What excites you? What do you enjoy? Because if you're not sitting there enjoying it as you create it, then it's not going to be very good. And so I get this this idea of let's have this, you know, instead of being a side character, let's put him right in the center stage. And so Saragal came into being. And then I wanted him to have a companion, sort of a Watson to his Sherlock. And so I created this little cardboard cutout and couldn't even think of a name for him for a while. And then I was working on some early chapters and my cat jumped into my lap while I was trying to think of a name. Well, my cat's name was Alec. And so I thought, well, I'll just call him Alec for now. <laughs> you know, and as you see, it stuck. So, and my cat was named after Sir Alec Guinness. So I guess he's Alec's grandfather. Um, so the landscape, like I said, was very male dominated. I wanted to create women who were strong without being unpleasant. And so you have Clia and you have the queen and you have the matri matriarchal line. And I tried not to make it anti-man, just pro-woman. And so you have the, you know, the prophecy that says, you know, that it must be a line of queens, and if they veer away from that, bad things happen, you know, because why not? Why can't we have that? It's, it's fun. It's, you know, there were matriarchal civilizations. We just don't hear that much about them. And so I wanted strong gay characters. I wanted strong female characters without making the male characters weak. You know, so you have Mike McCavish, who is just the greatest guy. I love him. And... Thero, who is very complicated, but he's fascinating. 
you know, and, you know, you have good people and bad people, and it doesn't matter what their gender or what their sexuality is. You know, I have bad gay people in there too. So, and, and bad, powerful women, because you don't have these big blocks. You know, it, there's just these gradients of personalities that you have to have to create a full world. It's really fascinating yeah. because I read a lot of, um, I, I am a reader of queer books, mm -hmm. especially um, sci-fi, fantasy queer books, in particular fantasy queer books, but it's harder to find them. Today, still today, it's harder Just to today. find them than yeah. yes, it's there. And uh, so I read all the book in the eighties. Actually, after I read your, and I saw Night Runners as really the okay. This is where we were going. This is uh, the, <laughs> the the perfect thing, uh, at least oh. for my taste. I really want to know how the readers reacted to your books with the really feminist themes, but without, uh, like, it's not uh, feminist, it's not uh, queer positive, because uh, we create a queer character in a system of oppression. We do not create strong women in a um, misogynistic context. It's just, uh, let's say that the Night Runner world building is uh, really, really refreshing under this point of view, because uh, it's simply not an issue. There is no misogyny, there is no homophobia, there is uh, neither of these things. They just exist, which yeah. is a thing uh, really, really difficult to find in books in general, yeah. because usually the idea is to fight the system to subvert the, the system which is fine but sometimes mm -hmm. you just want to see bisexual guys uh, stealing in the houses so. <laughs> and i give you that <laughs> yeah you gave them and nobody after you gave them the same thing <laughs> so how did the readers uh, react to your book at the time and uh, how do you feel knowing that you had a huge impact on the new generation of queer readers? Because as I said before, I am an obsessed fan. So I follow <laughs> you on uh, the social media. And it's really, it's really fun for me seeing on Twitter all those uh, authors that I like and yeah. seeing them uh, just you casually passing their mentions and they say, oh my God, Linda Welling, I really, <laughs> I love your book. They shift me as a author and they help. Okay, I'm not alone. Also my favorite readers uh, are obsessed with Linda Welling. So how, how, it, how they reacted then and how do you feel knowing that you shaped the way in a degree? Okay. Um, I didn't know how it was going to be received. It, it's interesting. When I was writing the books, I belonged to a writer's group in a bookstore. And the owner of the bookstore who hosted the group kept saying, why don't you make Alec a girl? I don't think people are going to go for this gay thing. You know, you've got to make Alec a girl. And I said, I'm not making Alec a girl. No, certainly not. So I, I thought I'll never find an agent because this won't sell and I'll never find a publisher and but I don't care I, I think my I don't care I'm going to do it anyway kind of attitude got me through and so when I did finish it I did find an agent and I you know to find an agent you send out many many letters to, to, to different agents and the the ratio is about 25 no thank yous to one yes I love it and so I got two yes I loves it and I chose my editor, Lucienne Diver, who is just wonderful. I, she is so good. And so she called me and said, oh, I love this. It's so good. And I said, really? Really? You like it? Because <laughs> I was surprised that somebody would want it. And then she found me, uh, a woman publisher, uh, Ann Grohl, who was then at Bantam Books. And so I got two women on my side. And then the books came out. And I didn't know who would read them. And I mean, they've never been bestsellers, unfortunately, but they have they do continue to sell. Luck in the Shadows and all of them are in print today, 20 some years later. So that's a good thing. I began to get mail, emails mostly. And a lot of it was, I'm gay and I'm really happy to see myself in these books. You've given me a hero. 
that I can identify with and not have to, you know, imagine that this hero is gay or, or whatever, that they just are. It's, it's canon that they are. And so that really kind of warmed my heart. And then I got two letters from people who said my book stopped them from committing suicide. I got several letters from people that they used the books to come out to their families. But probably my favorite letter that I ever got was an actual handwritten letter from a prison in Florida. And this man who was imprisoned in Florida wrote me that I was destroying the fabric of the American family. And he wrote me all these references and how awful I was. And I thought, you're in prison, buddy. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but it just, it was so funny and it went on and on and on. But I just remember that destroying the fabric of the American family. So I thought I must be doing something right if he doesn't like it. Like priorities, <laughs> like <laughs> you are in prison, you are, you are in jail, but <laughs> your, your priorities are a little bit uh, yeah. strange at the moment. Yeah. yeah, I've just gotten a handful of negative mail and I've got so much positive, you know, from readers like yourself and uh, I, when I was publishing the first two books, I belonged to a church and this little old lady, you know, she must have been in her 80s, came up to me and told me how much she loved my books and was I going to write more? <laughs> so even the old church ladies like them. So it's been, it's been kind of a spectrum. You know, I have a lot of female readers, male readers, gay, straight, queer, whatever. And I'm, I'm delighted that they have had some meaning in people's lives. So I, I was just writing a story. I could not predict that it would actually help anybody. And I'm glad that it has. If from a, like an informed reader as myself, <laughs> it's, uh, it's really obvious to see that even though um, like in the shadows, talking darkness and so on, maybe they do not have uh, in the uh, imaginary, in the fantasy imaginary, a place uh, such as uh, Robin Hood, uh, such as Martin and so on, but uh, I think uh, they set uh, the the standard about uh, many things, about many elements of uh, queer and not only literature, fantasy literature. I think that is a book that maybe is not for the public, but uh, it's a book for fantasy reader that mm -hmm. wants something different, wants something yeah. really, really different that is well written and so mm -hmm. I think that uh, maybe not all readers have read uh, Luck in the Shadows but uh, those who have read Luck in the Shadows are a peer reader, a peer reader. <laughs> so yes, now I ask for uh, some suggestion from you. So what do you think about the contemporary fantasy landscape? Uh, what are you reading right now? Or maybe not something from 20 years ago because they are hard to find in Italian <laughs> and if you wanna do recommend something uh, that you're liking that is uh, quite new or quite old anything okay let's see well well what I'm reading right now is more um, supernatural because my current work the book that I'm working on is is a ghost story and so i've been reading a lot of icelandic noir which i just love i don't know if you've read in that genre but uh, there's a an icelandic writer whose name i'm going to absolutely butcher uh irsa sigurdard daughter and she, two of my favorite books she wrote i remember you and the undesired are just chilling wonderful books i just love them uh, I just finished Sylvia Moreno Garcia's Mexican Gothic, which is we have that in Italian. We have that. Oh, <laughs> oh you must read that. It is so weird and wonderful. <laughs> it's just weird and wonderful. So those are some of the books that have excited me lately. You know, back back in the day, you know, I, I've read uh, Tolkien a million times, and uh, I like the Belgariad by David Eddings very much. Um, 
and I won't say who I don't like. <laughs> so, so I will never ask. Uh, so yeah. what, what do you think uh, about uh, where now is fantasy? What do you think about uh, if you have an opinion about fantasy landscape or, or if your um, time with fantasy ended uh, with uh, the natural runners? Hmm. I don't read that much fantasy now. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of it is more paranormal, paranormal romance, paranormal fantasy, thrillers, and so forth. And those are all great. They're really great. It's, lo it's lovely to see this bold new genre that really, I mean, part of it started with uh, the Mercy Thompson books uh, by Patty Briggs. You know, she really hit hard with, uh, you know, the werewolves and the vampires and all that in a very kind of a gritty way. But uh, like I said, I don't read a lot of fantasy right now because that's not what I'm working on. Makes sense. Like you absorb ideas, uh, moods, atmosphere from other uh, writers, from other yeah. books. And if you are writing a ghost story, you need ghost stories. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've been rereading a lot of Edgar Allan Poe. So, one of my foundational uh, writers. And so let's ask the last question, which is a kind of a um, bit of a serious question, but uh, also a um, weird one, as really an Italian question, which okay. is about uh, the war building. First part, uh, serious question. Okay. Because okay. your war building is memorable, in particular, the common saying, like in the shadows, of course, Tali. Personally, sometimes I have to stop myself from saying billiards balls because <laughs> it just uh, it's, it's really raw on the tongue. And which were your uh, main references? How were you able to write such a perfect common saying, but uh, the war building as a whole? Well, the world building was based on a lot of research because I thought I could make my world more real if I knew how medieval sewers worked or what the inside of a castle is like and how I actually did so much research on archery for Alec that I took up archery myself for a while. I was not very good. And so, you know, a lot of the world building comes from either research or real experience. A lot of the, like the northern parts of the country are based very much on where I grew up in northern Maine with the forests and the farms and, and all that and the hunting. I was a hunter growing up. So I have that, the ethics of, you know, you only take a life if you have to and you take responsibility for what you do is what I grew up with. So. Let's see, what else? Um, the sayings, those just come to me. You know, the characters are so alive in my mind and I'm writing and these things just fall out on the page. <laughs> so yeah, luck in the shadows, I don't even remember. I've used it for so long. I, I, I know that it just kind of fell out of my head. So it's it's inspiration. Yeah, well, you are very good at doing things without knowing uh, where they came from. <laughs> like, t especially the um, Tali. Tali is um, mm. really wholesome, uh, really intimate uh, word. It yeah. doesn't mean anything, but uh, it's uh, really appropriate. Anyone, even without knowing the context, is able to understand somehow what tally means. Yeah, yeah, tally, tally menus. The the um, Sc uh, not Scott. The Oranfe language is actually based on my little bit of study of classical Greek. That's where a lot of the structure comes for that, and that's why there's so many accent marks. Yeah, and now the Italian part of the question. Okay. Okay. The capital of Scala. 
How do you pronounce the name of the capital of Scala? Rimini. Okay. Are you aware of Rimini City in Italy? I was not at the time that I <laughs> created it. <laughs> because it's like we are at Rimini, which is a very famous uh, sea location, a vacation uh, in Italy. Yeah. Every so often, I have somebody from another country say, Oh, did you know that this town actually exists in Russia or wherever? And so, do you know the theory about monkeys and typewriters? Yeah. If you give enough yeah. monkeys with typewriters enough time, they'll rewrite the works of Shakespeare. I, I think that's it. <laughs> you know, it was just a monkeys and typewriters type of situation. But I, I love the word. I love how it flows off the tongue. And now I have to go rim, go to Rimini, Italy, for some reason. Yeah. Let's see what the now real you place have is to like. come, You have to come to Italy anyhow. Oh, <laughs> In I'm some way, so you can come to Italy, to Rimini. <laughs> yeah, I would love to come to Italy. It's, it's on my list of places I really want to go. <laughs> yeah. And so actually my questions have ended perfectly. I was scared with the time that uh, it wouldn't be enough. So I say that we can uh, finish the interview part. I'm going okay. to steal Lynn Flewelling for uh, 10 minutes, 10 more minutes because I have one hour with her and I'm going to use the whole hour. Nobody is <laughs> going to stop me. But I think that for the public eye, for the for Italy, the interview ends here. We I leave you with a goodbye from the author and uh, Luck in the Shadows and the Night Runners is coming out uh, on the eighth of November. But I really doubt this uh, interview will come earlier than that <laughs> date. So you are going to find Luck in the Shadows and Night Runners. Uh, Fortuna nell'ombra uh, in the library right now. So go buy and read it. I'm going to leave you to make the wedding for a final goodbye. Thank you very much. I hope you all enjoy the book as much as Elena obviously has. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>